Good morning. Okay. Right. Um, so my name is Abhijit Moni, and uh, I work for Internet Society, Washington DC. We also have headquarters in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, our interest on the internet is. <laughs> our interest on the internet is basically we 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 have an interest of uh, ensuring that the internet continues to evolve in an open uh, and inclusive way. That means nobody is left out. And uh, our vision is actually the internet is for everyone. So uh, with that vision, we try to go out around the world and make sure that uh, the evolution that takes place on the internet uh, is inclusive. That means nobody is left out. Uh, it's open, meaning that uh, interoperability continues to take place. And also, there is innovation taking place because uh, we try to support and ensure that the principles uh, to which the internet was built on are, uh, continue to be supported and maintained. Um, with that, I want to uh, go through a presentation. And uh, first and foremost, this presentation was prepared by my colleagues um, in the public policy department. We have a department uh, that's responsible, really, that's focusing a lot of uh, time and efforts and resources towards participating within uh, the wicked, within the ITRs. ISOC is an ITU um, member as well. And uh, Trump, we are supposed to be doing the ATU as well. Um, we, we have an interest in the policy, the public policy discussions that will take place. So uh, I'm speaking here. Um, my comments here, of course, will not be entirely as an official spokesman from uh, the public policy team, but I work for the Internet Society, so I'm representing the views of the Internet Society. And, um, I hope that uh, I'll, I'll do justice to, to, to this particular presentation. Next slide, please. So, um, one of the things that's happening this year, and I'm happy with uh, Anis's uh, earlier presentation, which highlights uh, a lot of issues related to the IT apps. What's going on today is that the discussions around the internet has caught a lot of attention. And that attention has brought in governments into something called the internet, which for many years, uh, as you can imagine, the treaty that we are talking about, the ITRs, was done in 1998. 1998, sorry. At that point in time, what was the internet? There, there was really nothing. You know, there was really nothing with regards to the internet. What was there then was technical. So there was voice. That's the time when you needed to make an international call. You had to call the operator to connect you. And you know, they, they, you had to call the operator to give the number and they were told wait. Right? It's the time when you needed to call Mombasa. You had to go through the operator. They had this system of dialing you and connecting you to them. So at that point in time, in fact, I remember the billing model at that point in time, there was a trunk call, right? There was a trunk call to Mombasa, to the, even to the next city, Thika, was a trunk call. There was an area code for Thika, which is 40 minutes away. That was telecommunications then. Telecommunications today means I have, it's a very different meaning. And by and large, it's because of the, the, the disruption of the internet on telecommunications, for lack of a better word. The internet has disrupted the way telecommunications operate. And by disrupting the model of telecommunications, then there's been an interest, especially by governments, to try and bring on the internet into the telecommunications regulatory or internet, the international telecommunications regulations. And one of the areas we have concerns of is that by this treaty being addressed, it's going to affect the operations of the internet, the architecture of the internet, the content, the security, and business practices with respect to the connection. 
And so those are areas we are, we are concerned about. It's a crossroad. Next slide, please. So, uh, there's a quote from the FCC commissioner. This is a regulator in the US. And the quote is that the effort to radically reverse the long standing international consensus to keep governments from regulating core functions of the internet ecosystem has been gaining momentum. The reach, scope, and seriousness of these efforts are nothing short of massive. <coughs> That's um, from the FCC Commissioner Robert McDowell last year. And that goes to the previous question of uh, which has just been asked by the board participant. And I think it's nothing short of massive. Next slide, please. We've also had similar, uh, uh, we've also seen, not similar, but we've also seen sentiments which either support why the RTIs are being revised and others <coughs> did justice as to why it is important to revise the ITRs. And also, uh, various governments have come out, uh, the Vladimir Putin of Russia has come out and said why it is important for them. Um, but let's look also at the input that's coming from the operators. What do operators think? What do you and I think when it comes to the ATRs? What is the impact that is going to have on us? If the ATRs, implementation of ITRs means I pay for more, more for the internet, I don't want them. If it means the prices go down, for me, that's the bottom line for me at the end user. Do I pay more or less? Um, Eric Schmidt of Google, the chairman of Google, said that it can be, it, it cannot be more emphatic. Be very, very careful about moves which seem logical, but have the effect of balkanizing the internet. That's a big organization like Google. They are concerned about the ITRs. Now, next. So what are the drivers of, uh, of the ITRs and the discussions around the world? There's one part of that, which is economic. Economic meaning that, as, as we mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, traditional telecom has an inherent uh, telecommunications regulatory uh, uh, agreement treaty that goes way back to 1988 which meant that interconnections were defined around costs. There were cost and billing structures which were laid out for telecommunications. When the internet came, the model was very different. We used pairing. That means we sit on a table and I agree to exchange traffic between you and me. We don't charge each other. We walk away. We are happy. Study shows that 99% of all interconnections on internet are done through peering arrangements which involve a handshake. Most of you know that currently there is a major interconnection issue where which involves CCK and the, op the mobile operators of a voice. Do you know what's funny? They are fighting over that voice, but they are also connected to the exchange point in Kenya where they exchange data for free. They don't need each other. Okay? So the internet has disrupted the telephones as we know it. But at the end of it all, this revenue being lost because of this model. Today, when I want to send an SMS, I don't use the traditional SMS. It's too costly. I use WhatsApp. Cost me not less. So who is going to cover for this most revenue. Some countries are actually going to a point and they've realized that they've lost a lot of revenue and they want to use the ITRs as a platform to recover the lost revenue. Political, their political interests. Some governments have lost control of their power 
because of the internet. And a good case is the Arab Spring. A lot of people have associated the Arab Spring with the internet. That's why some countries were to the extent of shutting down the internet. If you want to, if you, for them to have certain control over this resource, it has to be placed somewhere. There must be some something that supports the actions. When the internet was shut down, um, I think in Egypt, there was huge outcry from everywhere. Why would you want to shut down the internet? It was an embarrassment to the country for doing that. So the questions are, from a political point of view, could there be anything that supports those kind of actions? There are technical issues that have come up. Technical meaning, for instance, there is the new issue about IP addressing. New IP addresses are coming, IPv6. Who should be? Should we continue with the previous model of allocating these resources, or should we take up a new model? And the ITU has come up and proposed that they would be interested in IPv6 address management as well. The standards. There are different organizations that do standards development, ITU being one of them. But there's an interest to make sure that you know a lot of these standards development are done within one central location. Next slide, please. So I will not take too much time. Um, but for those who might be interested, you may want to know um, one of the things that is very important with the ITR process is the IT. And the IT is a large organization with many things that, uh, with, with uh, three main sectors. They have three sectors, that is ITR for the radio, ITT for the telecommunications, and ITD that does the development. So a lot of development and standards are done at the ITD. ITT talks about telecommunications uh, standardizations, and uh, ITUR is where we have all the radio discussion, the frequency spectrum, and all that taking place. And the uh, input, and normally, uh, this is this is one part which is of interest to most, is that the study groups, basically for you to participate in the study groups, this is where the discussions of the various policies takes place. And normally the people who participate there are ITU um, members, member states. What does it take for you to be a member? You have to join the IT, you have to be a member state. There's slots for vendors as well, vendors who pay to participate. But as you go up, the inclusion of non-member states, individual organizations, goes reducing. And by the time you get to the IT council, it's very much a member state affair. That means Every country has one vote. So when we go to the ITU Council, the IT planning board, Kenya has one vote. That vote, I don't know who has the mandate to go and vote this way or that way, but that is something I also need to learn. Uh, IT is very complex for me. I have to, I'm a technical guy. IT is very complex for me. Um, it's not as simple as what I'm used to doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and the wicked and the ITR tends to form in between there because they feed into the actual IT council and the planning board uh, discussions. Next slide. So, I've mentioned about the, uh, the ITRs when they were set up. The main thing about the ITRs is the three key points that they were to facilitate global interconnection and interoperability, uh, to underpin harmonious development and efficient operations of the technical facilities, and promote efficiency, usefulness, and availability of international services. Those were the key reasons why the ITR were established. Next slide. So, the question we have is what does the ITU uh, what does the wiki in 2012, which the wiki is the wiki that's going to revise, uh, uh, review the ITRs, the 1998 treaty, and that's going to happen later in Dubai this year. So the question is, 
what are they going to be doing? What are the issues they're going to be addressing? <laughs> Primarily, I think a good question to ask is, are the ITRs still relevant today? Are they relevant? What are the obligations to the member states? What impact does it have on interconnection? Should we be adopting the IT recommendations? Should these ITRs provide provisions for the new issues? What are the new issues? We have misuse, we have content, cyber security. We've seen uh, CCK here, Mr. Katun, says we should include security because it's important. The question is, how do you define security and what is important? Um, what's the role of ITU? Because that's a key thing that's coming out within the ITRs. What's the role of IT for? Can it be an enforcement? Does it enforce? Is it mandatory for every state to abide by their recommendations? Next slide, please. So, I'll go through uh, this. I know I've taken a bit of time, so I'll go through this very quickly because uh, Alice did a lot of justice in presenting uh, the revisions. And uh, just go to the next slide, please. This is just an overview of the areas that are currently being revised and reviewed within the ITR. Uh, transit. <coughs> now, somebody asked about. Um, no, sorry, the question was different. So there's a question of transit rate. Transit rate is what what do we pay for ups, to upstream providers when it comes to interconnection? What do we pay to get our traffic carried to Europe? Now, this is being revised so that it's equitable, so to speak. But the wording there tends to raise a lot of concerns. Now, one thing we have to remember is that this, the first thing is inclusion on the internet in the proposed ITRs. The ITRs uh, as, as they exist, uh, the 1988 treaty does not include internet. It only includes telecommunications. So, in the current revised proposals, there is inclusion of the word ICTs. That means internet as part of that. Now the question is, when we talk about transit rate, transit rate did apply those days. There was uh, a 50-50 or there was a sender pays all agreement on telecommunications. That's why calling internationally traditionally was always expensive because you paid for the traffic going, going and coming back. Now the same thing they are proposing to apply on the internet. Should we be excited about that? Do you want to pay the same way you paid for voice calls for the internet? Did your WhatsApp work the same way? Those are questions you need to ask. Um, termination rates. Who pays for termination? The calling party or the terminating party? Spam. How is spam going to be handled? The internet engineers, as it, uh, as it is, we've been unable to fix spam. The larger question is because spam has an underground market of its own. But how do you address spam if it's an underground market that drives it? Because spam is business. There's so much money in that world that it's, it's become almost impossible to they get smarter every day. They will always be smart. You come with new filters tomorrow, there's something new. Fraud, the same thing. Having and hubs. Uh, somebody asked this question about interconnection. Does email from Africa have to go to Europe and come back? We've done a lot of efforts to establish what we call internet exchange points and regional exchange points where traffic within, for instance, currently in Kenya, we, we can be very proud to say that all, at least all traffic in Kenya stays in Kenya. We've gone to an extent where we are exchanging a lot of East African traffic through Kenya. Not all of it, but a good percentage of it. 
we are making efforts as the internet society to make sure this happens throughout Africa. But the discussion going on around having and have means that they want to introduce tariffs into that process. Currently, it's bilateral, meaning you and I agree to exchange traffic, either through peering arrangements, that means we exchange traffic and no costs, we don't charge each other, or what is called pay peering, meaning because there is traffic imbalance, you pay me a little bit. But those are bilateral agreements between the people who own the traffic. These proposals that actually is under have and having is slightly different. It imposes that there should be a fee. From my own understanding, it could be different, but it imposes that there should be termination agreements on interconnection. Now, it already happens in the voice world or the telecoms world. It doesn't happen on the internet. Now, the question is, if we group internet and discuss changes here, what does it mean to our internet? Calling party identification has been mentioned, calling party number. Now, these two I find them very interesting because of one thing. And the reason, as Alice mentioned, when you go to Geneva or somewhere and you get a call, I don't know how many of you have ever received a call and it shows a very weird number and you find it's somebody who is abroad calling you. Most of you have seen that. So, this is because of alternative ways of calling, alternative calling uh, methods. Basically, they're using, they're bypassing the, the temples or the expensive routes, let's put it that way. They're bypassing, I don't want to say temples because temples will get upset, but they're bypassing expensive methods of calling, which means they are avoiding the traditional ITR treaty kind of setups and using alternative internet-based ways of routing the call so that it's cheaper for the calling party. And that's why by the time you get the call, you actually don't even know who's calling. So the question is, if they insist on this, it means you have to follow a proper channel. What happens to the alternative ways of calling? That ends. So what happens to international call? What's the impact? Um, there are a couple of other things, I think, and I'll spend too much time if I go to them. Child online protection has come up, but we haven't seen a, a single pro, uh, document on that. There's no real proposal on that. Network security and stability, again, uh, there are a couple of proposals on that. Now, having and hub has come from Rwanda, for instance. I've seen Rwanda involved in that. And the question I have is, and this will go back again to Alice, is we, like personally, I haven't seen the proposals that have come from Africa, the ones that have been submitted to, that, to, to, to the IT. So personally, I don't know what's in there. And I'm sure many others here have as well. So if there's any way I had to can actually help in us having access to see those documents from Africa, it's going to be very useful because we can say, we like this, we don't like that. This is an African position, but we are not particularly sure whether it actually helps us. Thanks. So, <coughs> sorry. The other thing about, and, and so this part of the ITRs is one thing I have also had to learn. The discussions of the treaty are very interesting. For you and I, we are women. We, we sort of look at words as what they mean, you know. But when treaties are being discussed, the words can appear, if you read the first time, it will appear like, oh, that's, that's harmless. That looks normal. But in actual sense, the impact it has is very different. Interpretation is also plays a part. So, um, a couple of things, like for instance, they made slight changes to, to the document, the definition, the scope of the ITRs. And the scope says, as well as the efficiency, usefulness, and availability of international telecommunication services. But they've actually put the word to the public of. And what that means is that the scope may be for all existing, emerging future telecommunication uh, facilities and services. 
So it's extended to anything that is there today and yet to come in the future. So it will already fall under the high terms. Next slide, please. Um, so another concept is introducing the, uh, the mandatory status of ITU standards. Should they be mandatory that everybody applies them? Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are some other discussions about the quality of service. A lot of operators are quite unhappy about this. Um, the quality of service, basically, the, what it states is that member states shall ensure that administration, operating agencies, cooperate in the establishment, operation, and maintenance of the internet network to provide satisfactory quality of service. Operating agencies which include all things internet, e.g., voice over IP operators and service providers. So you can see where it's going. So voice over IP is being mandated. Now, we all know how the internet works. You have control over, over your internet up to the upstream providers. The next upstream has control of the network up to their boundary before they get to the next network. Now, how do you enforce end-to-end -end quality if you have no control over your network beyond the next upstream? It doesn't scale. How do you even enforce it? What do you do? You have three operators. Even the cost of making that work. I'll give an example. I'm an ISP, right? I buy capacity from teams because it is very cheap. Thanks to Bona Demo and Zemo's cheapest cable we have. <laughs> so I buy a lot of capacity on it. All my users are happy. But because I have to be redundant, I have to put buy an extra capacity from another cable. Let me not mention it. But the cable is expensive. If I have to buy the same capacity as I have from teams, what does that mean for you as the end user? If you have to get quality of service, whether the team's cable is up or down, it means you have to pay. So if you introduce QoS as a mandatory requirement, it means you as the end user have to pay more because for me as an ISP, it means I have to buy, to buy equal capacity on both links so that in case there is failure on one, I maintain the same quality of service on my backup service. And this other cable will not give me the same price as, as the team's cable because it's a business model. So that's why you can, you know, that's why a Mercedes does not cost the same price as a Toyota. It's a business model. Right? So how do you maintain quality of service? It is not possible. So, realistically, it is going to be difficult. Next slide, please. Routing regulations. This is an interesting one. And affects the same question we asked. Does your traffic from email have to go through Europe? The internet is very diverse. How your traffic leaves your network is not necessarily the same way it gets back to your network. If I send a pack, I can decide because the Teams link is cheaper. I want my traffic to go out through Teams and come back to Teams. It's a question of the business model. If I have to state how my traffic leaves my network and comes back in, your internet is going to be very expensive. Because for me, I will prefer one of the other cable providers will influence, say, you should use this cable. It's better than the other. We're living room where the choice of costs can actually be affected because somebody has dictated how the traffic will be there, how traffic is routed. And that breaks the internet model. Remember, the internet model is more on interconnection. We have peering arrangements where nobody pays anything. We have transit arrangements. That is a business decision each and every organization should make. If you are paying for high quality service, I will put you on a more expensive cable that is very reliable, very fast. If you are an end user customer at home, I am sure you will not complain if your Facebook loads 
that you are able to send the images. Nothing about what you do on social networking is a priority compared to what a business does. And those are business decisions ISPs make. That's why you find a package for home users. Yes, that's why they have packages for home users and for businesses. Businesses pay more. Right? It's there. If you want the business service at home, pay for it. You will realize the difference in the quality of service. It's, you have a choice. So, if that is enforced, then what happens to the choice? Next slides. Um, so, this, there, there's been a proposal from the European Telecommunication Network, uh, ETNO, and this one is tending to address a couple of issues. There's a huge discussion going on in Europe about net neutrality. I don't know whether you've heard about it. And the net neutrality debate is showing up at the ITRs. And it's supported, then it will work. Does it work in favor for us? I am not particularly sure whether it does or it does not. So, I will leave it at that because um, I'm sort of running out of time. But remember, this is sending party network pages. Now, let's look at it from that point of view. Sending party network pages. Who is the sending party network? We are. Facebook is out there. And so is YouTube. If we have to pay, what happens to us as the end users? Okay. So we have to be concerned about that, uh, whether that proposal is something that's favorable to us or not. So that plus end-to-end -end quality of service, those two things will always be a problem. Next slide, please. So finally, and I'll just touch on this and then conclude, is that we feel there are also other things that are missing on the ideas, which are more fundamental and important to include. For instance, competition. I haven't seen anything about competition on the IT. Um, regulatory independence, network innovation, liberalization, privatization, transparency, key issues which have been part of discussions for a long time on internet and all the other lists. But what I'm seeing is focus on billing, who pays who what. Innovation side of it, it's not, it's not included. Next slide, please. So those are critical uh, things. Uh, next slide. And essentially, the most important thing is that for you as the community, as the stakeholders, you need to get involved and know how to get involved in the process. I have to say, and I really have to say this, that I'm proud to be a Kenyan. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, in the US, they had a congressional hearing about the ITRs. Because their parliamentarians wanted to know what, what do we need to do. And they called in experts. Everybody who they believe is an expert was given the opportunity to speak at the congressional hearing. In Kenya, we have a forum where we can actually say what we think should be in the ITR, what should it be in the ITR. How does it affect us? and even ask who is going to go there and represent us and say, don't touch this even by a 10 foot hole. Or this is internal, don't go and take it to the global level. In other countries in Africa, they don't have these process. In fact, I know of governments that have gone and put positions up there, but I believe they don't have a process where their government can actually go out there and engage the stakeholders to get a view of whether the position they are taking is of benefit to their stakeholders and community as a whole or not. I am glad we don't have a proposal from Kenya because if we did, I would be concerned at what point that was discussed by the stakeholders. After this, if the government goes and puts in a proposal at the ITU, I will know I participated in the process. That's why I'm proud. So uh, I'd like to end there. And in ending, I'd like to say this.
when it comes to ITRs, the discussions is engaging people at the global level. We need to understand, and I say this at the ITU meeting in Norway, we need to differentiate between issues that we can address locally and issues that need global intervention. Sometimes we miss the point and we take local issues at the global level. And that does not, that's why you don't get any support, because that's your local issue. So I will take questions later and I can expand on the rest of the issues later. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you a link to call your presentation controversial, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll avoid saying that. I'd like to um, announce uh, the honor of uh, having uh, Dr. Vitalia Demo joining us this morning. Uh, he's going to give us a uh, huge address in a few minutes, but I think Dr. Demo, if you allow me, I'd like to take a few questions on fees, uh, on ITRs, and then we can have you speak. Um, and also, uh, so, are there any very quick questions? Very quick questions, please. <laughs> One, two, three. Only three, please, and then so that we're able to the rest of the room. Okay, uh, I just have a very quick question concerning the impact of uh, member states to the ITU in the wicked uh, conference this December decide to actually pass many of the recommendations. Now, I've been reading quite a lot that the, that the UN is trying to actually uh, make or take over the role of ICANN and maybe the other functions. And I was wondering, supposing member states were to decide that they want more active ITU participation in running of the IANA function, which is currently at ICANN. How this go about? Will they grab the functions or will they come up with competing the DNS? Uh, please, may somebody maybe clarify on that? We are allowing only three questions because we need uh, uh, Dr. Vitaly and Lemo needs to leave. We can continue with this discussion later. So perhaps the second one uh, is from the lady. Thank you very much. Um, one, uh, one day, we should be, sorry, um, this might sound like a very simplistic question, but I just need to understand. On your comment with regards to hubbing and transit rates, what are we saying ultimately? That my Yahoo and my Gmail will cost me? Is that, is that what we're saying, ultimately? Okay, there's a thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, first of all, um, I represent an NGO for women's rights. And on your, on your new, um, on the revising of the bill of the draft, you do not include women protection. There was child uh, protection, children's right protection, which you think was not has not yet been drafted. That's why I'm asking why has it been drafted because uh, children nowadays access uh, internet on their mobile phones, and some of these websites you just uh, when you go to uh, some of these uh, adult websites they just ask you are you 18? You click yes. Maybe they're 10 years, 11 years. As I think it's a very crucial, um, it's a very crucial thing that needs to be addressed. The next one is on the women's rights, the women's protection. Women nowadays are, are victims of uh, internet uh, and cyber. And um, now, like women nowadays, um, we find that women are taken in, they like to on the internet and they're going for jobs, where they end up being prostitutes, and um, they also end up working for for their bosses with little or no pay. Um, what are you doing to address um, these things? I, I think they need to be fitted on. On 
Okay, um, so um, I'll take those three questions. Uh, so very quickly, the first one is uh, IT is trying to take over the ICANN and IANA functions. What happens in the member states for the I would say that's highly unlikely. If it does happen, well, that's a whole new discussion all over again uh, because I can't even begin to imagine where the process will start or end. But essentially, this, at this point in time, it's highly unlikely. If it does happen, I believe I believe that there are other um, mechanisms that are there to take place that you know, people will have to transition to. But at this point in time, it's highly unlikely. Um, does your Gmail and uh, so your question is uh, with respect. So the thing is, when it comes to the internet, there, there exist business models in which networks interconnect, which are far different from the ones that are used on voice communications. Uh, in that, some networks. I'll give an example. If you if you have a connection from Kenya to London with no internet at all, you can actually go connect to uh, Yahoo and Google without having to pay. Their networks are already there. It's called peer. They let you connect to their network because your network is bringing more users. It's called peer. You don't pay to connect. The provider does not pay to connect to their networks to access the content. Uh, but in case you can't link your network from Kenya to London, then you have to pay somebody to get you to London. And that person connects to London, gets the content for free, but charges you so that they can recover their cost of operating that infrastructure. Now, if we introduce tariffs along the path, it means that when they can get to London to connect to Google, they have to pay as well. Now, it changes the model. What does that mean to you accessing the internet? You would pay Google or Yahoo, but your cost of accessing the internet is likely to go. So, the peering, it's called peering, the peering and transit model of the internet is in its own right, it was the internet's own innovation, which is a far different billing model than that of the voice, traditional voice at telco world. And that has brought disruptions to the telco world. And that means they've lost revenue in the process. And that's why this discussion to bring on that, uh, um, the internet into the same framework as the telco, so that some of those revenues can be now, I hope that answers your question. All right. Um, if it's not clear, please talk to me during the coffee break. Um, women protection, and why there is no proposal on child, uh, children protection. Um, well, I'll simply put it this way. For there to be a proposal at the ITR, the member states need to submit a proposal. So it's a bottom-up process, if you will. So if the member states don't come up with a proposal, then it remains as it is. So at that point, maybe you, as the women's, uh, as the representative of the women's group, uh, uh, you need to draft a proposal, engage the government, so that they can submit a proposal. Remember, this will have to be deliberated at the regional level, and then, uh, or rather, at the direct level, which is like East Africa, before it goes to the regional level, at the art level, and then submitted to the IT. And for the proposals to go through, it also needs to get support from the other countries so that the more people support it, remember each country has a vote, then it can pass. So there is a whole process to it. I cannot say that we are late. We still have time. So the question is, are you in a position to work with Alex and the rest of the team to develop a proposal that can actually go to that respect? And also, remember I said, we have to be very careful between what is a local issue and what's a global issue. If it is very local to Kenya and does not affect others, you will not get support. Because remember the treaty is affecting every all countries of the world. You know, they, they have to choose whether to, to take it or not. So we have to be careful about the fine line between what is local and what is global. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure there are many other questions, but we can hold them until the tea break.